Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. On our latest edition of You Make the Call, you may remember how we do this. I show you two slides. We discuss what the likely diagnosis is, and then we give you the diagnosis. Incidental finding. What do I see here? I'm looking at the left ventricle. I'm looking at the left atrium. And then I see this outpouching between the left atrium pushing into the patient's right atrium. This is a very specific finding. You could say, could the patient have a, uh, a connection between the right atrium and the left atrium, but then you would see not such a smooth border and more of a jet phenomena. This is a different entity, and you probably recognize it as an ASA, an atrial septal aneurysm. It's unusual, but we do see it occasionally. It's the bulging of the fossa ovalis 10 to 15 millimeters beyond the tissue of the interatrial septum, typically from left to right. It's associated with PFO in the majority of cases. If filled with unopacified blood, it can mimic an intracardiac mass. Here was very nice the way you see it pushing into the right atrium and opacified with contrast. And again, here was an article by Razak a couple years ago. Although these abnormalities are considered clinically benign, they have been independently associated with ischemic stroke. So most of the time it's an incidental finding, but it can have consequence. Patient with chest pain, anterior metastinal mass eccentric. It would be great to know the patient's age. Let's say it was 40. I'm still thinking thymoma first. I'm putting uh, lymph lymphoma up there. Teratoma, because it's so solid, it would be less likely. This is not the appearance of a thyroid extending downward. So eccentric solid mass, anterior metastinum, I got to be thinking thymoma. And the diagnosis is thymoma. So we're pretty good, solid, eccentric, variable in size. This is sort of a typical sized thymoma. And here's just another set of views with the coronal plane, which again, adds credence to its position, location, and its diagnosis. Patient with chest pain, there's a cystic mass, and it seems to have some fluid layering. It could be, from this example, a, a pericardial cyst, great location. Could be a bit low, look a bit funny, but it could be the lower view of a bronchogenic cyst, which occur by tracheal bifurcation commonly. It also could be a mediastinal mass, like a thymic cyst, which is hanging downward, or even a teratoma, which often has like mottled density. So those would be the differential diagnosis I would think about. And this was a teratoma. I think this layering effect probably gives it away. Obviously, you would like to follow it upward. You would like to see it in coronal plane. But again, it's a good differential because what if this was your highest section on an abdominal CT? It shows what you would have been thinking about. And here it is very nicely when I do get the coronal view, that soft tissue density, the cystic components, and its positioning, just a very nice example of a teratoma. Patient with weight loss. The first thing I see is markedly thickened gastric folds. Could this be carcinoma? Could this be gastritis? Could it be Mitriez disease? You also then see what looks like a mass in the body of the pancreas. It's also enhancing. When you say, I have a mass in the pancreas that's vascular and thickened gastric folds, you got to be thinking about a gastrinoma. That's something really good to think about. Uh, again, they're rare, and uh, but we do see them. But again, the gastric fold thickening alone, if that was all I thought about, carcinoma, I prefer lymphoma, it doesn't look like GIST, miniaturized disease, severe gastritis, but I would, if that was the only finding, I would really target down on lymphoma. And that enhancing pancreatic lesion was a gastrinoma, which explains the thickened folds in the patient's stomach, okay? That hypertrophy of the gastric folds. The most common functional pancreatic endocrine neoplasm in patients with MEN1 is gastrinoma. And you can see the functioning gastrinomas release excess gastrin, causing gastric acid hypersecretion. And then you get the very thick gastric folds. You also can talk about things like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, 
where patients get duodenal and jejunal ulcers. So again, when you're looking at the stomach, take a good look at the pancreas. Make sure you're not also having a concurrent pancreatic lesion. Patient with abdominal pain, cystic lesion, right upper quadrant, two images. Well, it could be gallbladder, but let's say it's not gallbladder. It could be pancreas. Then I'm thinking cirrhosis adenoma, maybe mucinous tumor. Couldn't rule out a cirrhosis adenoma. Theoretically, a duplication cyst. I would love more images. And this was an MCN. Now, MCNs, mucous cystic neoplasms of the pancreas, most common in 40-ish year old women, most common in the body of the pancreas. This is a bit atypical coming off the pancreatic head and hanging downward, but it's that differential diagnosis that really helps you. And here's just a few more views of that. Incidental finding, cystic lesion body of pancreas with septations, location, septations are all great for an MCN, Patients usually a 40-ish year old females, but obviously not always. Differential diagnosis could include a cirrhosis adenoma. Could include an IPMN, maybe with high-grade or low-grade dysplasia. But location, if the patient's 40-ish female, I got to be thinking MCN. And that indeed is what it was. What about this mass? It's a mass by the tail of the pancreas. At first glance, you start saying MCN, SCN, or serous cystic neoplasm, IPMN. But then you look particularly on the coronal view. The cystic lesion really ab seems to abut the pancreas. So you could throw in a duplication cyst of, of the stomach, let's say, or a small bowel, or even mesenteric cyst. But it really is coming from the pancreas. The cystic lesion that kind of comes from the pancreas but as the appearance of abutting it and scalloping is a lymphoepithelial cyst. So I'm going to bet we're dealing with a lymphoepithelial cyst, which indeed is the correct answer. Again, more common in men, usually incidental. They're always benign. If you know that's what it is, you can leave it alone. Patients with lymphoepithelial cysts and surgery often get significant pancreatitis. 45-year-old female, cystic lesion tail of pancreas, differential diagnosis, again, an MCN, serous cyst adenoma, large IPMN, will all be considerations. You also could consider is this something near the pancreas, but not from the pancreas. I would probably, 45-year-old female, I'm kind of jumping between MCN and SCN, and this indeed was a SPEN. SPEN tumors, Solid papillary epithelial neoplasms are typically in teenagers or women in their 20s, but they can occur in men and they can occur in any age group. This one's unusual that it's totally cystic. They're usually cystic and solid, often will have calcification. You've got to think about spen tumors. Um, we have seen them, in, as I noted, in a range of patients, so at least consider that possibility. If a spen tumor is resected early, there's a 90 percent cure rate. And here it is just showing you that tumor again, best defined in the coronal view. Abdominal pain. If you look at this cinematic rendered image, the thing that impresses you the most is look at the SMA. Look at the beating in the SMA. Look at the irregularity. This is a vasculitis. There's also little areas of beating in some of the jejunal branches. So to me, this is going to be vasculitis. With that beating appearance, I would push to FMD, fibromuscular dysplasia. Interestingly, in our experience, and hopefully we'll write this up someday, people always speak about FMD in the renal arteries and carotids, which are true, but we see it very commonly in the SMA as well. And this ended up being FMD involving the SMA. And here's just a few more images showing it very nicely, that right view, that sagittal, very nice. And here's that original image again. This patient has back pain. There's a large mass coming off the sacrum anteriorly, infiltrating the foramen at S1 and S2. It's infiltrating the bone on the sagittal view. So what do you got to think about? You could think about a colon cancer invading in, but 
There's no colon cancer there. Could be metastasis. But what you really have to think about is location, location, location. What occurs in the sacrum that commonly involves bone, has a soft tissue mass, and comes outward? That's going to be a chordoma. You also could think about unusual things like extramedullary hematopoiesis, which gives you more sclerotic changes in bone, commonly seen in thalassemia, but typically not this bulky. And so when you look at this, this was a chordoma. Remember, cervical spine and at the sacral level, chordomas are very good diagnosis. And chordomas are common in individuals age 40 to 70. They're the most common primary tumor of the sacrum. Chordoma is a low-grade tumor but causes significant morbidity and mortality with local recurrence. Okay, just something to be aware of. We don't see all that many chordomas, but we do see enough of them. And with that, let me say thank you for doing a great job discussing the cases with me. Again, we always have more than two images, fortunately, or maybe we would read very quickly, but often it's certain key images that allows you to make the right diagnosis. And hopefully that's indeed the case. And I wish everybody a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.